in some ways it, it sort of collapses because there's no rules. Um, there's no tracking of the cash, there's no tracking of the marijuana. And when you go from a product that has been legal or illegal for generations and you legalize it, in this case under the, med the, the medical marijuana laws, you need rules and a framework. And California never had that. And it left not only the state vulnerable, but these individual businesses vulnerable to prosecution. Hi, I'm Zach Weissmuller for Reason TV. We're streaming live from Reason TV's Los Angeles studios. We're here with Peter Hecht, uh, an award-winning journalist and author of the new book, Weedland, Inside America's Marijuana Epicenter and How Pot Went Legit, which uh, I dare say is the definitive history of California's marijuana legalization movement from its humble beginnings as a ballot initiative allowing individuals to grow a few plants in their homes or backyards for medical purposes to a green boom that transformed the agricultural industry of Northern California all the way to a full-scale, multi-billion dollar industry that spread across the entire state and drew the ire and full force of the federal government. California no longer leads the way when it comes to marijuana legalization, having been leapfrogged by Washington State and Colorado, but as Hecht thoroughly documents in his book, the failures, the triumphs, and the personalities of the California pot legalization movement have shaped the drug policy debate in America in deep and unexpected ways that will certainly have effects for years and maybe decades to come. Peter, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here at Reason. Um, so the marijuana legalization in the medical sense was in, started in 1996. You open your book with a 2002 raid, though, that really kind of put the issue into the public consciousness and, and kind of exposed marijuana to people in, and made people think uh, in a different way about it. It was a raid on a Santa Cruz farm that was growing marijuana for very sick people. Can you talk about why you opened the book with uh, that, that story? It was something that I came to see as the Garden of the Eden of this story. And what you had was a group of, of severely ill patients. They had cancer, they had AIDS, they had leukemia, they had debilitating injuries, some were in wheelchairs, and they were cultivating their own marijuana plants, and they even had wheelchair, wheelchair ramps between the plants, and uh, they raised their own cannabis, they shared the medicine at weekly meetings, uh, over the years, uh, many scores died. They had their ashes uh, scattered in the terraced uh, 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 mountains above the garden, and uh, they're commemorated on painted stones and so forth. And this was sort of the true of the true marijuana patients collective. But in 2002, the Drug Enforcement Administration, led by a former U.S. Marine captain, who ironically had been just returned from an assignment as an air marshal fighting terrorism after 9-11 on flights out of New York City and the Salt Lake City Olympics, they decide to make a stand and raid this colony. And heavily armed agents uh, with battering rams came in. Uh, they rousted a polio patient from her bed. They, they arrested a... Um, a medical marijuana caregiver, Mike Corral, and his uh -huh. wife, Valerie Corral, who was a seizure patient who would later kind of become known, although she never gave herself this title, but, but pretty much become known as the Mother Teresa of the medical cannabis movement. Well, it was a, it was a PR disaster. Uh, protesters came out. S some of the medical marijuana patients blocked in the DEA convoy. It became a national news story. Um, and for days afterwards, there was this sort of national media narrative that the federal government had essentially conducted a raid on compassion. And it sort of stir, stirred an image of medical marijuana as a healing medicine, and, as, and the government is heavy-handed. But what follows after that is dramatically different than what we saw there. And so this 
story is sort of the contrast to the billion dollar industry that developed with retail style collectives that looked nothing like this garden. And the entire sort of landscape seemed to change. Yeah, and one specific uh, piece of legislation that came out of that was Senate Bill 420, um, which essentially uh, set the framework for the dispensaries that we now see all over California. Um, and uh, you say SB 420 was drafted with rules as hazy as pot smoke. Um, how did that, the haziness of those rules uh, affect the future development of the marijuana industry in California? It, the nebulous language turned out to be very dangerous language and opened up a lot of these establishments to uh, not only ultimately raids by the federal government, but uh, crackdowns by law enforcement because the law was so vague. And the law was inspired by this notion of a collective. And so essentially what the legislature passed was a law that said qualified medical marijuana patients can associate to collectively or cooperatively mm -hmm. grow marijuana for medical purposes. That was the entire, essentially the key phrase in the bill. And on that phrasing soon hung within a matter of several years, a billion dollar medical marijuana industry in which retail style stores were dispensing thousands of pounds of marijuana and buying thousands of pounds of marijuana and handling millions of dollars, sometimes tens of millions of dollars in cash transactions. And ultimately there's going to be a federal, federal backlash, but in some ways it, it sort of collapses because there's no rules. Um, there's no tracking of the cash, there's no tracking of the marijuana. And when you go from a product that has been legal or illegal for generations and you legalize it, in this case under the, med the, the medical marijuana laws, you need rules and a framework. And California never had that. And it left not only the state vulnerable, but these individual businesses vulnerable to prosecution. So here in, in Los Angeles, uh, we have a lot of medical marijuana dispensaries. And it's something that has upset the uh, local government here at, at various points. Um, do, is that directly a result of those hazy regulations? And um, is there anything wrong uh, with the fact that uh, there's so many of these businesses that have popped up? Well, uh, clearly in Los Angeles, Los Angeles doesn't do anything in a casual way. I'm an old Angelino. And the city just exploded with dispensaries, and the numbers varied widely, uh, 700, 800, 1,000. The, the cliche was more dispensaries than Starbucks, but that, that vastly exaggerates the number of Starbucks. <laughs> um, there were, were so many, um, they were unregulated. Uh, some of them were professionally run, a lot very much, not so much. Um, there were questions about where the marijuana was coming from. Um, and every time the city of Los Angeles tried to do something about it, they would get sued. And they kept losing in court. Um, and so, the funny thing about marijuana is it seems that the only people that can sort out the politics of pot are voters. The politicians can't seem to do it themselves. Um, so LA passed a series of, of ordinances and regulations and ultimately they, they, got, they frustrated and threw up their hand and tried to close virtually every dispensary in the, in, in the city and having patient cooperatives of three people or fewer or four people or fewer um, and that was over the, the medical marijuana movement raised signatures for referendum, knocked that out, and ultimately voters approved a ballot measure to allow a couple hundred odd dispensaries in, in Los Angeles, uh, notably some of the older and more established places, which may or may not be fair. And, um, and my understanding is I've heard as we speak, there's still 800 to 1,000 dispensaries in Los Angeles. So it's going to take a while to shake out. The federal government for a long time was sending out seizure orders 
and any place that the city attorney's office was looking to close down medical marijuana establishments, the feds were close behind them with property seizures. The, the feds are losing interest in this battle, which is a notable part of the story. And I think the will of the city is being tested in terms of how much it, it is able to regulate. And, and places can open for a few months and, and clear a couple million bucks. They're going to try to do it. So it's going to be interesting to see what, what happens in Los Angeles. But when you look at the contrast, you look at Oakland. Oakland has, uh, well, they started, they had four medical marijuana dispensaries. I believe they now have six. Now, mind you, one of them, Harborside, is the, la the largest dispensary anywhere on the planet. <laughs> That's pretty good volume. But the city was able, early on, to set fairly strict rules, to set local taxes on it, so they were more proactive. By the time the LA got engaged on the issue, um, the market was already in runaway mold, and the city has only has constantly been trying to catch up. It's something that's something that's always struck me as it's something you hear a lot that it, there's these runaway dispensaries in Los Angeles. But uh, my thought has always been like, so what? That's the demand. There's a demand for all these uh, dispensaries, clearly. So what exactly is the criticism? Well, there's clearly an, a marketplace idea. Mm -hmm. If the market can hold it, so be it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the city was concerned uh, on a number of levels in terms of law enforcement issues, in terms, I mean, a lot of neighborhoods didn't want them near them. Right. I mean, as, it's, as it fanned out, it went from business districts more into neighborhoods, places like uh, uh, Boyle Heights. You know, neighbors were complaining um, they didn't like uh, the cannabis scents, you know, kind of. You'd have the the panaderia brush, bread shop one place, and and the, and and the, and the pot shop someplace else, and you know decidedly different vibes in that, and so there was a lot of complaints from the neighbors. Those are natural neighbors, though. I mean, you hit the panaderia after hit the pot shop. Yeah, I probably should have thrown in the pizza place too, <laughs> um, but cities do have the right, and this has been this has been upheld by the California Supreme Court. You know, they have the right through local zoning laws to sort of control what goes where. And so that's what Los Angeles was trying to do. And they haven't been able to figure it out. They, you know, for a time they didn't want um, uh, any dispensaries within so many feet of, of, of an alley. But the planning grid of the city is alleys run behind many of the major streets and arteries. So that wasn't going to work. Um, and so I guess there's, there's still still struggling for this. So, I mean, I think basically it's kind of like liquor stores. And there's constant arguments of some neighborhoods that have way too many liquor stores. Mm -hmm. Other neighborhoods, for some reason, have been able to regulate them out of existence. So Los Angeles is just trying to bring some sanity to this. And they haven't really been able to do it. Now, voters have given them the, 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 the power to do it by Passing, which is Measure M. Mm -hmm. Was it me Measure M? Or measure yes. M was the tax measure. Oh, okay. I thought Measure M was the. And well, anyway, voters basically had a choice of measures, one which would have allowed uh, uh, pretty much unlimited dispensaries in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. That lost. And the other was to allow roughly a, a couple hundred or fewer, many of them who were the original dispensaries in the city, and that's what, that's what prevailed. So. Um, so that's what they're trying to achieve. This is some sort of order out of chaos. It'll become much easier for the city if these all become state regulated and licensed entities. It will both take pressure off the city and make it easier for the cities to enact and control local rules. You mentioned uh, uh, Oakland earlier, which was is kind of the medical marijuana capital of California. And one of the biggest players in the medical marijuana uh, scene is Richard Lee, who you profile in the book. Um, also the architect of the failed Prop 19, which would have legalized marijuana uh, for commercial use uh, through or recreational use throughout the state. Um, one of the most interesting, there were a lot of reasons Prop 19 didn't ultimately succeed, but one of the more interesting reasons was division within the medical marijuana movement itself and the legalization movement itself. Could you talk about 
uh, that those uh, schisms and, and what it all meant and how it played out? Well, Prop 19 really splintered the medical cannabis movement. And part of it started for reasons of political pettiness, is that Richard Lee was an outsider. He was not part of the original sort of Prop 215 coalition. Uh, so he was this sort of interloper who comes in. And so there was resentment on, the, on that front. There were other people that also believed that it's a practical matter. 2010 was a bad year when 2012 would have a better electorate with more younger voters. And then there were other people that complained that um, it added laws. So basically it set an age of 21 for legal recreational marijuana use, meaning that if a 21-year-old passed a joint to a 20-year-old, they could be subject to penalties under the law. So a lot of people were upset with that. But a lot of people were, were, were protecting their constituencies. Many medical marijuana dispensaries were fearful of this. Uh, they feel the potential uh, changes in the marketplace from legalization. Uh, Long-time illicit growers in Humboldt and Mendocino County and the Great Emerald Triangle in the north uh, were terrified about prospects of legalization, about uh, pot prices flatlining in this new economy. Um, so the, you know, there even was a bumper sticker, um, uh, save Humboldt County, keep pot illegal. Um, and um, uh, one of the leading cannabis physician groups, which had an obvious reason to be concerned about this, um, came out against it, saying that it, would, it, it could threaten access to medical marijuana because there are provisions in the law that would allow cities and counties to ban marijuana dispensaries, meaning legal uh, recreational <laughs> cannabis dispensaries. And, people feared that that could be applied to the medical establishments. So there were multiple layers, and then there was sort of the old soul of the movement that felt um, almost that any law was a bad law, and they were, they were kind of the social and political descendants of Jack Hare, who wrote the infamous movement manifesto, um, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, and um, you know, alleging historical uh, hi, uh, historical conspiracies behind the the uh, marijuana prohibition and hemp prohibition, and he had before he died, um, he had advocated a much more sweeping initiative, freeing all marijuana prisoners. Um, I'm not sure if this was in this, this particular version, but some of the versions he advanced were you know, allowing everybody to grow 99 plants and, and so forth. So a lot of people looked at it as a politically crafted sellout. So it splintered the movement. And yet, heading close into September, it was winning. Voters embraced it. And then something dramatic happened. Which was? Which was... Uh, Eric Holder weighs in. And why does Eric Holder weigh in? Eric Holder weighs in because he gets a panicked letter, calculatedly panicked, from retired administrators of the Drug Enforcement Administration. And they basically said, look, you have to intervene in this, uh, Mr. Attorney General, because if you have sanctioned businesses in California paying taxes on marijuana to the state, they are effectively admitting to a federal crime of illegal drug trafficking. Now, the letter ignores the fact that California at the time was already over collect collecting over $100 million in sales taxes on medical marijuana alone. But some weeks later, now uh, Prop 19 was winning in the polls, up between 9 and 11, 12 points, depending on which poll you looked at. Uh, Stephen Colbert was on television saying that the most popular and uh, candidate, political candidate in California was Mary Jane Vaughn Spliffenberg, otherwise <laughs> known as marijuana. That's how he said it. So, but Eric Holder came out and he said the feds were not going to tolerate legal recreational cannabis in California. Now, cut to the present. What happened in Washington and Colorado, which as we know, legalized marijuana for recreational use in 2012. The former district, uh, D uh, Drug Enforcement Administration administrators sent the same letter to Eric Holder, warning of calamity if these states legalized pot 
uh, beyond medical use. Eric Holder didn't respond. And I kind of wondered about that. And you kind of look at the political map, well, Colorado was a, spring, a, a swing state. So what happened? Well, Obama won with 51%. Legal pot won with 55%. And the same margin as in Washington. And then what we had happen after that was the Justice Department moved forward in almost un, uh, unprecedented, uh, potentially landmark terms of concession, where they said, OK, we'll step back. We're going to leave you, Colorado, and you, Washington, alone if you run this with robust state regulation and oversight. And they said, we don't want interstate drug trafficking. We don't want criminal gangs infiltrating these marijuana operations. We don't want uh, trafficking to children. We don't want uh, destructive marijuana grows imperiling the environment. So that's kind of, to me, it was kind of, kind of the first offer for, for maybe the, the end of the drug war. Mm. And then we have this action in Congress most recently where the House votes to defund the DEA in states uh, that have legal marijuana for recreational or medical use. Now, I don't think that's going to go on and ultimately pass, but it, it, it is in just a few years you see how rapidly the attitudes have changed and the, the political institutions and the government institutions are reacting to that. So it becomes a fascinating story. Yet here in California, the raids were only amped up, uh, I mean, immediately in the wake of Prop 19. Why did the federal government react so differently and so violently here in, uh, in California? Uh, two reasons. Prop 19 just sort of revealed to the world and particularly to the U.S. Justice Department what existed here. A thriving billion dollar medical marijuana industry making cannabis widely available. It was also overwhelmingly unregulated. And um, while the movement talked about compassion and care, um, the feds saw unscrupulous operators operating beneath this veneer this of medical marijuana. And on one front, they were right. There were big farms in the Central Valley uh, in which plots were staked with physicians' recommendations for medical marijuana that were shipping hundreds of pounds to places like New York or Massachusetts or Connecticut. You had a dispensary uh, here in the Los Angeles area, NoHo Caregivers, where you had people sending Blackberry messages bragging about all the money they're making. And it was an outfit that cleared some $11 million in three months, and, the, and they, were, they were shipping back east. They were just blatantly uh, trafficking cross-country. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing that the feds targeted were sort of the business class, the Wall Streeters. Um, they were professional people who, who tried to follow state laws that didn't really exist and who tried to be compliant and tried to operate as nonprofits, which is what the, what the law seemed to specify. And they began investing in dispensaries and professionally run grow rooms, ironically what was happening in Colorado. And, um, but they also started expanding, more dispensaries, more marijuana stores. And so the feds started to go after them. And then ultimately, the, the, the raids would go after icons mm -hmm. of the marijuana movement, people like Richard Bree, whose university was, was, was raided, whose dispensary was raided. Uh, they filed, uh, uh, they, they raided the model grower for the, the probably most successful local regulation program in Mendocino County, mm -hmm. where the sheriff's department had literally sort of tagged and tracked marijuana plants to try to separate the growers operating in the legal market as opposed to the black market. And they, they raided him, put him out of business, and then ultimately they, they filed civil actions to try to close down Harborside, which is a case that's still pending. So, and the reason that they were able to do that, um, at least other than the egregious cases of interstate drug trafficking, was California never passed laws. There was no Tenth Amendment states' rights defense. Mm. So, which has prevented the feds or discouraged the feds from going in, you know, whole hog in Colorado. They have done some prosecutions, but not nearly to the same scale. So California, the birthplace of the medical marijuana movement, the home of the largest marijuana economy anywhere, never set the rules. 
They're still grappling over it in the legislature as we speak. That left the state not only in, in vulnerable to federal incursions, but also enabled n numerous local law enforcement agencies to impose drastically different rules on marijuana businesses. Uh, it, it's interesting, California's kind of fuzzy rules. Uh, uh, it's always been a sort of contradiction in my mind. The, the entire, um, the movement gr grew out of this idea of um, compassion, um, which I believe a lot of people in the movement are very compassionate and that marijuana helps very sick people. But there's always been this kind of hippie-ish language of uh, co-ops and collectives and we're not going to make a profit, we're sharing, but it's never seemed realistic. Do you think that the, is, is there a sense that the sort of feel good, like non-profit type uh, outlook from the beginning seeded the destruction later on because yeah I think it was a uh, it was both a mistake and oversight um, uh, the clearly the political leadership had no idea where this was going and then the more the industry grew the more they were courage challenged to do anything about it mm -hmm. and I mean in a perfect world you would have seen um, legislation around 2008 2009 to set rules for the emerging industry and that's what Colorado did mm -hmm. I mean partly because they didn't want to become the next California in part because they had California gondrepreneurs as the term is streaming into Colorado trying to get into their business mm -hmm. so they set very strict rules um, where every medical marijuana worker in the state was licensed in criminal background checked by the state the businesses were all licensed they had to grow uh, in state supervised uh, cultivation warehouses or greenhouses, all the shipments were tracked and monitored. Uh, regulations that were very onerous to a lot of people in the California movement, but there were regulations nonetheless that that provided a a working model. And and California became intimidated by the growth of its own industry. Now they, there may be a bill that gets out of the legislature this year, we'll see. If not, don't be surprised if you don't uh, see another ballot initiative in which uh, advocates will just take it to the voters. Funny thing about marijuana is it's very driven by voters. Politicians, now this House vote recently was interesting, but politicians by and large don't like this issue. It's not a winner for them. Um, at, at the core of uh, any anti-prohibition movement are kind of the are the individuals who flout or at least try to push the laws to the limit, and a lot of them are documented in this book. Whether it's doctors who are prescribing when they're not sure exactly what the law is, or uh, you know farmers willing to grow uh, outdoors and and uh, push the limit of plants, or people who are willing to uh, talk to the media or the government about smoking marijuana and um, uh, a lot of them risk prison time and a lot of people in this book have served prison time. Um, what you uh, profile medical marijuana growers Dale Schaefer and Maggie Fry and when they were convicted uh, in federal court their attorney called it a horrible historical martyrdom. Um, do you think that's an accurate characterization of how history is going to look at uh, these people who kind of flouted what may be unjust laws? Um, well, that case in the Sierra Nevada, Dr. Molly Fry, and, and she was a, a medical cannabis physician, and she was a breast cancer survivor. Her husband was a lawyer, and they were very much believers in the movement. And she created this uh, practice where she was given out medical marijuana recommendations in a very rural area um, in a town called Cool, classic name for a California town. It's actually near the uh, site where James Marshall discovered gold. And there was this huge pilgrimage of people coming up there to get these recommendations. And so far so good because um, it, Within a year or two after that, there would be a federal court decision that said uh, doctors pretty much had free speech rights to discuss and recommend marijuana to their patients. There is no such thing as a marijuana prescription, but they may they can recommend it for medical use. Um, at the same time, the 
husband tried to come up with a system, this is sort of pre-dispensary explosion, to deliver cannabis to the patients. And he felt that that was not only right, but, but righteous. Um, but you can't do that. Um, it's very perilous under federal law or, or, or state law. Doctors can't, they can recommend marijuana, they can't provide it to you. They can't tell you where to get it. And the irony is, and this is a saga that stretched over years, this couple is being stalked by local narcotics de detectives, not secretly, in the open. They're, they're inspecting their gardens, they're talking with them, they're yucking it up. Meanwhile, they're recording the plant counts, they're building a case against them. And ultimately, um, they were raided by local authorities and, and the case turned over to the, uh, to the feds. So it was, it was a case that very much was sort of heartbreaking and sort of a, to, the, to the movement. Um, but then you had other people that were very different, different models um, that that really did push the envelope in terms of the size or the scale of the business. And some were very professional. I mean, Harborside Health Center, for a time in Oakland alone, was handling $22 million a year in cannabis transactions. Um, but they pay their executives, as far as we know, fixed salaries. They would have holistic services, a naturopathic physician, mm -hmm. uh, chiropractic care, acupuncture, uh, counseling, even counseling for marijuana dependency and how to wean yourself. So they had, they were kind of almost like the Kaiser Permanente of weed. <laughs> and so they had a very professional way of looking at it. And then yet you would have a street corner dispensary um, handling millions of dollars of cash and just skimming the money off the top. Mm -hmm. And you'd have, you know, there was one guy in Sacramento, you know, making videos uh, uh, for, uh, I think it was an MTV program, Who Wants to Be in the Cannabis Business, where, you know, he's parading around with, with wads of cash. He's got a quarter million dollars in his house. Um, he's bragging about how much money he made. There was an operator in the, San, the Orange County Beach community of San Clemente who was kind of the shadow... Uh, operator of eight or nine dispensaries and apparently made in a matter of years $25 million in cash. And this was a purportedly a nonprofit industry operating as patient member collectives under California law. So clearly the feds and, and local police saw excesses and they went after it. But then they didn't just go after the the egregious actors, they went after other people who thought they were trying to comply with state law. So do you think that we have to accept that people are going to make money off of marijuana if we're going to truly legalize it and, and make it work? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, the problem with the nonprofit model in California, which is still being discussed in the legislature, is it never really specified what they were supposed to do with the money. Right. Um, to some local police, if the mere existence of a bank account uh, would signify profiteering. You know, yeah. they, they, they didn't. They didn't have rules for what a nonprofit was. Now, Colorado just said, "Forget it." They're marijuana. They called them medical marijuana centers. They're stores. They make money. Interesting enough, the medical marijuana outlets in Colorado and the ones in California, the prices were a lot cheaper in Colorado. There was competition. A lot of places were forced out of business. Mm -hmm. um, now, part of the reason that the prices were cheaper in Colorado, and, and a lot of people out here hate, was they had an integrated model where the cannabis stores raised their own cannabis or they bought it from other cannabis stores. So it forced these sort of shotgun marriages between retailers and growers and places in Colorado uh, that were renowned for their pot growing traditions. There's a little town called Netherland that I mentioned in the book that's very similar to our, our Ukiah or, or Willits or, or mm -hmm. Arcata. Uh, those growers were pretty much shut out of the commercial market. And so California, what the movement's trying to do is to come up with some sort of rules and regulations that will basically uh, kind of allow kind of a farm to pot pharmacy <laughs> kind of model yeah. where they will have individual growers that would be able to earn an income doing this and there'd be sort of different tiers of taxation at different levels between the, the producers and the transporters and then the ultimate uh, businesses. 
Um, I think there's a chance it might get out of the legislature this year, and if not, um, look for it to be on the ballot um, in 2016. So a lot of people are uh, in the movement are optimistic and excited by what's happened in Colorado and Washington. The, there's still the looming question of what's going to happen here in California. Um, do you think it matters, and, and wh what do you think is going to happen in California, and how will California uh, affect the future of the movement? Well, California is still the, the you know the, the biggest car on the train, right. and uh, certainly Washington and Colorado votes have given a sense of inevitability that California will legalize marijuana beyond medical use in 2016. Um, I say that's probable, it's not a guarantee, and it, it could crash and burn if there is, again, very divided constituencies in the movement, if they write a, a bad initiative, which is very positive, which I mean, very possible. Um, it does have to have a mechanism. I think the average person who, who may not smoke marijuana um, they want to understand that there's some sort of rules involved. They want to understand that there's some sort of processes so that you're not going to have to fear stone drivers on the road. Right. That there's either an effective application of existing laws or there's some sort of standard for that. Washington has a standard, Colorado doesn't. Mm -hmm. A lot of the advocates don't really like the science of the standard. But, but anyway, I think the average voter wants to have some sense that it's going to make sense. And so... Uh, that'll be the key thing for 2016 in California. Right now, Florida is looking at a medical marijuana um, legalization, which could open up potentially the second largest cannabis economy in America. Um, so it's, it, it's changing tremendously. I think this is going to be played out for another couple decades, but I think very quickly, perhaps in the next couple of years, you're going to see some sort of compromise nationally in Congress between cannabis states and non-cannabis states, and, and you're going you're to see the, the federal government continue to step back. That may all change depending on politics, depending on election results and the, the constitution of Congress and the White House. But, but clearly, you've got to think about this arc of, of history. We've gone from young gay men dying in, in droves of AIDS in San Francisco and landmark medical marijuana research in California to the sites of thousands of people, many of them tourists, lining up to buy pot purely for pleasure from, in Colorado and legally doing so. And it's all connected and that's what makes this, this a compelling story and drew me in as someone who was not part of the, 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 the marijuana reform movement nor part of the marijuana prohibition movement. I just thought as, a, as an independent observer coming in, this is a multi-layered story and, and it was pretty fascinating. It certainly was and is and it's a fascinating book, Weedland. Uh, Peter Heck, thank you very much for talking to us. <laughs>